crashing river over the dam and its thunderous roar gives us some idea of the power of this small, hardworking river can generate. It's probably why Samuel Slater chose this location for his cotton mill. Hi, I'm Chuck Arning, park ranger with the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And I'm going to be your host each month as we bring into your living room the story of the Blackstone Valley. Now, you've probably lived here all your life, and you never realized that you live in such a historically significant region. You probably have vivid mental images of a foul, polluted river, empty, decaying mills, and isolated farms tucked away in the corners of your community. And while those images are real, their existence is why we're here to tell their story. The foul, polluted rivers gives testimony to the title of the hardest working river in America that the Blackstone River earns. The empty mills is a glimpse of the American Industrial Revolution that's had its birthplace right here in the Blackstone Valley. And those isolated farms is a reminder of the strong agricultural backbone that this valley had that lured mill entrepreneurs to the region. We consider this to be a living history because a lot of the structures and artifacts are still here in good working condition. So come on, folks, as each month we journey into the Blackstone Valley, we're going to learn stories about some of the characters who lived here, study more about the history and cultures that are here, surprise you with some interesting events you might want to participate in, and finally, give you opportunities to join us in the renaissance of the Blackstone Valley. So grab your shoes. You won't need a compass because you're with rangers. And let's go rediscover the Blackstone Valley. You know, winter as a season sure gets a bad rap. I know here in New England where we have wide swings in temperature and different weather conditions, people should enjoy it more, but they don't. My neighbors still complain about winter. Kind of reminds me of a quote by Mark Twain. He said, there's a sumptuous variety about the weather in New England that compels admiration or regret. He says, weather's always up to business, trying to try things out on people, new designs. Well, this winter, we've had plenty of new designs as far as winter is concerned. Ice, snow, freezing rain, cold temperatures, you name it. And yet, winter is the best time to be out and about. The foliage has dropped off the trees, revealing fantastic vistas that you wouldn't normally see. Mother Nature's artwork is at its best through its snow and ice. Wildlife you can see through their trails and tracks and other little mementos indicate there's a world that's still alive out here, even in the dead of winter. And finally, there's nobody else on the trail. So you get the whole place to yourself. So that's one of the reasons we're going to be out today in the winter, in the snow, out in the valley, because we want to show you just how great a time you can have. We're going to hook up with Chris Phillips of the Mass Audubon Society from Broadmeadow Brook up in Worcester, who's going to show us some things about the natural world. We're going to hook up with a couple of people who are working on projects this winter that will make our summer visits to the valley much more enjoyable. And finally, we're going to hook up with one of those organizations that's going to show us much more about the history and the culture of the people of the Blackstone Valley. So folks, grab a hat, some mittens, we're going to go on a winter discovery tour. We told you that winter was one of the best times to be out and about. And so we decided to bring with us a naturalist, Chris Phillips, who's the sanctuary director at Broadmeadow Brook for Mass Audubon. That's up in Worcester, isn't it, Chris? That's right, Chuck. Now, the winter is a great time to see Mother Nature at, I think, its best. Mm. And being a naturalist, you probably have a lot of experience of seeing the, what takes place here in the winter. Mm. Yeah, it's a real unappreciate, underappreciated season. Uh, the first thing that's beautiful about getting out in winter is that the landscape is laid bare. You can see the lay of the land. You can see the curves of the hills and where the brooks run. And uh, uh, when spring comes back, if you're a lover of winter, you get to feel a little crowded and you can't see too far. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. yeah. You can get out in the open, and there aren't many. Uh, there isn't many action going on uh, to distract you. 
But there is a lot of things that you can find in winter that you can't find at other times, like the hidden lives of mammals. Mammals we see, they're around us all the time, at night and in the day, but we rarely see them. And in the winter, we can figure out what they were doing, like these tracks here. At our feet, we've got two sets of tracks from two different creatures. The large ones at your feet, we discovered up on land, bounding through the snow right. with paired sets, like the weasel family will do. They came out on the ice and walked along the edge of Rice City Pond here in a normal walking stride. And right next to it, what we thought was a dog, is in a straight line with very small dog-shaped prints. None of them are too clear to tell for sure that it's a fox, but a dog would be wandering back and forth doing all kinds of wasted energy. A fox is just on his way to get his meal or get a shelter. And that's my, what we might be looking at here. A fox and a, a large member of the weasel family, a long-tailed weasel or a mink or a small fisher. Well, that's very interesting. And this we can tell that from just looking at the tracks right here. Mm. Now behind us we have some great birch trees as well, don't we? Yeah, we do. And I was just over uh, shaking the, uh, the, the birch here that's leaning out over the, the brook. And <clears throat> maybe we can get a chance to look at later the um, dust that uh, looks like dust that settled on the snow underneath it. And if you pick them up, they're the little seeds from the catkins and each shaped like a little hawk to help it glide out from the source of No its, kidding. Yeah. That's probably good uh, bird feed as well for some of the birds who winter in this area. That's right. And uh, we've got tons of red poles in the state right now all over the Blackstone Valley and the rest of Massachusetts. A little finch that normally breeds on the very northern edge of the forest next to the tundra. And they don't come here every winter, but when their populations rise and their food supply crashes, they make these eruptive migrations, they call it, down to uh, our whereabouts. And uh, they love birch catkins. Oh, great. Very tame birds. Little red cap, right, kind of like leaning for, forward on the forehead above the bill. Now, Chris, this particular winter we're experiencing right now, uh, because of its unusual cold that we've experienced for New England and over mm. the past 10 years anyhow, we've seen a lot more bird life come down here than normal, hasn't it? Right, right. Not only those red poles, but later on we'll take a look at a pine grove where we might be able to suspect uh, white ring crossbills or... Uh, well, uh, some of the extremely rare, rare birds that have been around have been boreal chickadees up at uh, just north of, north of here. Uh, if there was an area with crab apples or fruiting trees, we could look for the bohemian waxwings that have been getting a lot of coverage in the print media and uh, pine grosbeaks. Right. Yeah, I was just talking about the rare birds that have been around this winter and. Uh, Red-breasted nuthatches are one of them, and here we have one now. And I think a second one calling nearby. They sound like a very high-pitched, eh, 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 much smaller than our normal white-breasted nuthatches. I think you can make out the um, rusty red breast and belly area and a black eye stripe through the eye. That's Those are missing in the white-breasted nuthatch. You see them moving up and down the trunk of the tree, foraging for insect eggs. I can make out the rust there. That's, uh you got much better eyesight than I do, Chris. <laughs> yeah, well, I took a peek at them many times before. This is a winter, 1994, when there are hundreds of them where there were none last year and none the year before and ten the year before that. And uh, they're erupted down to find their food supply, which is in short demand in their normal Canadian territory. This is just another example of uh, each winter brings new discoveries, mm -hmm, doesn't it? Mm-hmm, yep, and uh, you never know what you're going to find. You never, uh, some winters there'll be no red-breasted nuthatches and then you can walk and see a hundred in one day where you'd normally see two white-breasted nuthatches. It's one of the reasons why winter is one of the best times to be out and about. Well, Chris, I want to thank you very much for uh, journeying out here. Uh, as you can see, the snow is a little deep and it's a little uh, more difficult this time of year to be out and about, but it is the best time because we didn't see anybody else on the trail, did we? No, not at all. And I'd encourage our uh, viewers to come out and visit Rice City Pond and King Phillips Rock and all of the heritage corridor areas and who knows what they'll find not only birds and not only trees and shrubs but uh, tracks of fisher tracks of fox other mammals out here that are enjoying the winter sure so let's head, we'll head out to the pond and see what else we can see okay sounds all good all right did you ever think about how you kept things cold before we had refrigeration well the answer is the ice man cometh Here's park ranger Suzanne Buchanan with our Blackstone moment. Hi, my name is Suzanne Buchanan and I'm a National Park Service Ranger with the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Carter. And I'm out here on Scott's Pond in Lincoln, Rhode Island today to talk to you about the sixth largest industry prior to World War II. And what 
that, you might ask? Ice harvesting. I am told that the seniors can vividly remember the ice men delivering ice to their communities. The ice man would deliver ice that had been harvested from a pond as we are here today. And how they would have done ice harvesting is they would have taken out their teams of horse once the ice was approximately 9 to 12 inches thick. And here they would score the ice and cut the ice into 20 by 28 inch blocks where they would approximately weigh 300 pounds. Once the ice had been cut into blocks, they would float the ice to the ice house, which was located along the banks of the pond here. Here the ice would be packed into the ice house. A traditional ice house would have had walls of 14 inches thick where they would pack the walls with sawdust for insulation. Once the ice was packed into the ice house, they would also put a layer of straw on top of the ice for added insulation. And there the ice would stay frozen until it was removed, sold, and delivered. The Iceman would, was a welcome sight to many for he brought refrigeration to the community for they could store their ice in their ice boxes. And also the children longed for the Iceman to come in the heat of the summer for he would break off chips of the ice and give to the children to cool them down. This has been Suzanne Buchanan for a Blackstone Moment. Until our next time, you take care and we'll look forward to seeing you again. It's clear that not everyone hibernates during the winter. Let's touch base with some of those projects and the people who are working on them during these cold, bleak, gray winter months that will make our summer much more enjoyable. Well, folks, we told you there were a lot of exciting projects taking place in the valley this winter. They're going to make the valley a lot more of an enjoyable place to visit this summer. And I have two of the people who are instrumental in making one of those projects come to life. And that's Jenny Leslie and Lisa Lawless, both with the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. Jenny is a planner and Lisa is a civil engineer. And we're here on the bike path right down in downtown One Socket. And ladies, how close is this project coming to life? Well, the bike path uh, started final design about a year ago. Um, it'll take about four or five years to design the entire project. Um, the project is about 20 miles long, um, connecting Woonsocket, Rhode Island, to Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and we're about, about three quarters of the way of getting down on paper uh, where the bike path is going to be, exactly where the bike path is going to be. That's great. Now, there's a lot of land acquisition involved with this, wasn't there, Jeannie? Yes. Um, actually, people have been talking about having a greenway, a series of connected parks along the Blackstone River for many years. We really got going probably a little over 10 years ago when the department received a great donation of land and water, the Blackstone Canal and the towpath down in Lincoln. After that, we really picked up some of our land acquisition efforts. We had a bond issue that was approved by the voters to give us some money to purchase land. And up till now, we've purchased about 250 acres altogether. That's for the Blackstone Park. Primarily, we've been active in North Smithfield, Lincoln, and Cumberland. What's really exciting about it is how all the towns have joined in on this project as well. They have uh, not only fixed up old existing parks like Cold Spring Park in Woonsocket, but they've also acquired additional land and um, not only are they protecting recreational areas, but also some important historic sites have been protected by the towns as well. One of the things that's really exciting about this is that the bikeway is going to be coming through and protecting all of and connecting all of these protected sites that we've been um, gathering up and improving over the last several years. So it's really a big partnership, isn't it? Oh, definitely. Um, we couldn't be doing it alone if just DEM worked on it. We just have a few isolated spots. But since we've got so much cooperation with the towns and the cities, we're really going to have a remarkable uh, collection of parks that the bikeway will go through. Some people talk about it as jewels on a necklace. Um, and we've got a That's lot excellent. of beautiful jewels, some of them more rural, some of them urban parks, like right, right here in Woonsocket and Central Falls and Pawtucket. And um, I think a lot of these things are really people are going to get introduced to them for the first time once the bikeway happens. I think the amazing part of this project, in, especially in Woonsocket, is uh, when the project is completed, there will be a bike path 
weaving through uh, a heavily urbanized area. This is the second highest densely populated area in the entire state. And I think it's incredible that we've been able to find um, property and, and pieces, bits and pieces through the city that we can connect um, a continuous bike path through the city. People are going to be amazed when they come back here and, and they're going to be able to ride through Woonsocket uh, along the river, go out riding through parks that they may not have even known were there before. I have nothing but praise for uh, Rhode Island DOT and Federal Highway for coming forward and being incredibly cooperative. Um, this project is is innovative um, and it's different than um, projects that have been, you know, funded in the past through, D, you know, highway funds. Right. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, difficult to try something new, um, but they have been very, very cooperative. And well, that's excellent. Forward. Well, tell you what, let's head out here and uh, explore some more of this bike path. Okay. Ladies, you lead the way. Okay. okay. We don't want people to think that they can't go out. We're here at the River Bend Farm, which is in the middle of being restored, as you can see. It's one of those projects we talked to you about that will make our summer visits here in the valley much more enjoyable. With me today is Linda Neal, who's the Blackstone coordinator for this particular project, and John Pelzarski, who's the senior supervisor here for the Department of Environmental Manager for the state of Massachusetts. Now, John, there's a lot of history with this particular farm, isn't there? Yes, there is, and uh, the purpose of this visitor center is to interpret some of the park of the history of agriculture inside the park in the Blackstone Valley. This, this uh, farm actually has roots that date back to 1784. It was owned by uh, four different families between 1784 and, and 1974. When the Voss family owned it between 1920 and, and uh, 1974, it was the largest dairy farm in the Blackstone Valley. Really? So what we intend to do here is bring the people into this newly constructed visitor center when it's done and, and interpret the agricultural history of the Blackstone Valley and tell the people about uh, how the farm to factory story during the Industrial Revolution. That's great. Now, Linda, this project took a lot to get off the ground, didn't it? This oh, yeah. was a real challenge. Oh, yeah. Um, whenever we do a project with partnerships, it always takes a little more time, but I think the effort in the long run is worthwhile. We worked, um, the national, I represent the National Park Service, and we're working with the Blackstone National Heritage Corridor Commission with the state of Massachusetts and with um, various agencies within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, um, such as John's department, the Department of Environmental Management, the State Historic Preservation Officer, um, you name it, we've worked with them to bring this project together. And that's a lot of people involved with one little farm, isn't it? It, it certainly is. Now, John, you personally managed a lot of the material acquisition here and saved the state a lot of money very creatively, didn't you? Uh, yes. Uh, Tennessee Gas Pipeline was putting a, a new line through the Upton State Forest, and they had to cut a 35-foot wide easement uh, through the Upton State Forest, two miles long. And uh, what we did was salvage all the saw logs, uh, the oak saw logs and the pine saw logs, and we're going to use that lumber that was cut to construct a lot of these, the, the uh, beams and the sills for the barn and also the uh, siding, so that'll save us a lot of money. That's outstanding. Now, Linda, when can we expect to have this project off the ground where people can come in and actually use some facilities, which I understand will also include a bathroom? Oh, yes, yes. It'll be, um, the first floor will be um, open to the public year-round, and the second floor will have exhibits um, planned later on that will be open during the warmer months of the year. Um, we expect this summer things to be open, so we're looking forward to it. Well, that's great. Well, folks, this is one project you're going to be able to utilize this summer. It's a great way to introduce yourself to the Blackstone River Valley, and it's right here in the Blackstone River and Canal Heritage State Park. Weather in New England is always unpredictable. But in winter, that unpredictability is more ominous. Take freshets, a sudden overflow of a stream due to heavy rain or thaw, not uncommon in late winter or early spring, yet its consequences can be dramatic. It was the freshet of 1886 that survives longest in the memories of New Englanders. The 1807 flood was insignificant in comparison, wrote the Pawtucket Gazette. 
and the freshet of 1876 was a full two feet short of the 86 mark. The combination of rain, snow, winter cold produced huge ice flows that were powerfully dangerous and yet strangely fascinating. The ice flows actually swept away portions of the wooden mills that lined the Blackstone River. The freshet drew huge crowds throughout the weekend. Spectators jammed the bridges and police had to forcibly clear paths for pedestrians. When an old submerged wreck or a huge block of ice slammed into the abutment of the Main Street Bridge, and it happened several times, the perceptible jolt would drive the large crowd of onlookers rapidly off the bridge. Only return once satisfied the bridge's stability, drawn by curiosity and Mother Nature's fascinating display of raw power. Good afternoon. There are a lot of very interesting stories in the valley, and there are a lot of very interesting groups who are trying to tell that story. We happen to be with us today, the Educators of the Blackstone, a very dynamic organization that is intent on telling the story of the Blackstone River Valley. We're here with the President, Carol Shearis, Ranger Jack Whitaker, and teacher Sue Remington from Rhode Island. And we're here to find out about this organization and some of its goals and its missions and some of its successes. There are a lot of successes. The fact that we have grown so much, we have already expanded our membership to several people outside of the realm of education, which we're very pleased about. The Touchstone School is a wonderful example of successes. It has received a partnership grant with the Park Service to create a database. The database is basically to accumulate primary sources so that people in the valley can call on this database where they may find the additional information to create a curriculum. And then we will piggyback on that with the intents of creating a curriculum that will be available throughout the entire valley from Worcester down to Providence and as far east and west as needed to share the valley's history. We've sponsored a lot of activities so far, one being a conference that was held last May that was very successful. We got a lot of Rhode Island and Massachusetts teachers involved. Great, great. And it, it worked out beautifully and uh, now we're sponsoring a series of forums um, on Monday nights, on the last Monday of the month, where we feature different people from different towns that tell their story and tell what they've done uh, in, the, in the valley. In that way, we're becoming educated ourselves. We've met people who are students of history. And uh, we call ourselves the educators of the Blackstone Valley because we really don't want to limit it to professional teachers. We feel that everyone who has a story to tell in the valley is an educator and the willingness to share it with one another just enriches all of us. We rely an awful lot on Jack. Jack is a member of our organization and we very much need his involvement and your involvement because we need to know many of the hidden treasures that still exist in the valley. And Jack has brought them to our uh, forefront. Jack, you've been in the air from the beginning, haven't you? Just about. I, I think the educators for the Blackstone are a great example of the catalytic action of the Park Service here in the valley. Uh, when Chris Stein, our chief ranger, came aboard, we had already done uh, a program in the schools, and we were finding that teachers in both sides of the on both sides of the line, Massachusetts and Rhode Island, had been doing similar things. They all had units on the valley and the history of the valley, and uh, we saw the wheel being reinvented here and there. And Chris had been active with a group in New York called Educators for the Gateway, uh, the area around uh, well, just this side of New York, the Bronx, and that area. And uh, he brought up a couple of their representatives, the president of Educators for the Gateway, and he spoke to a gathering of teachers. Uh, Carol and Sue were both there in that initial moment when the idea was, was spawned. And from that, the educators spun off and have been doing, I think, a tremendous job ever since. Uh, the hope is that we'll get educators on both sides of the line to forget the line and right, right. compare notes, share their, their wealth of knowledge, and bring people from every area. As you uh, know, there are people out there who are not teachers, but are educators. And they're the kind of people we want to see joining our group and, and coming to our programs and sharing their information with us. But there are some needs of the organization, aren't there? Very much so. And what, are, what are a couple of needs you really could focus on? Well, we want to grow. Well, we want to grow by membership because we feel that everyone that joins us in this endeavor enriches the children of the Valley and enriches us as teachers. So we would like membership. Membership in the spirit of becoming students of history. Well, that's great. And being a member of the Educators for Blackstone doesn't mean you have to be a teacher, a parent, an educator, a member of a historical society, or all qualified individuals if you have a story to tell. And this, this group is really very adamant about looking for new people to bring into the organization.
The valley is full of interesting stories that take us back to a different point in time. I recently talked with Zeke Hammond, lifelong resident of Hopedale, Massachusetts, and a local historian who told me a story about the Draper family. Turns out, back in the 1920s, the Drapers would hire a police officer, station them at the bottom of Northrop and Dutcher Street, and would direct traffic so the kids could ride their sleds down the hill. Pretty amazing story, huh? But just one of the many stories that take place here in the Blackstone Valley. And over the next several months, we're going to tell you more stories, interesting facts, and places to go here in the valley. So folks, this is Chuck Arning, park ranger of the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor, telling you to keep warm, and I'll catch you in the valley.